Okay. So thank you everyone for joining and welcome to our event. This is an event organized by the ECS project and I'll start the presentation um, now in a second. All right, so um, this um, event called ECS Project Showcase, sharing insights and facilitating dialogue in citizen science will run for appro approximately 90 minutes until 1.30 CET. And I'll go through the agenda now. So we have um, split the event into two parts. The first part will um, yeah, last um, roughly 45 minutes. And after a short presentation to the ECS project and the presenters um, from me, we will have four presentations um, from our speakers in the ECS project that I'll introduce in a second. And this will be followed by one or two questions from the chat, uh, if, if you have any questions. And in case we cannot, we don't have the time to address them, there will be plenty of time in the breakout rooms to do so. Then the second part of the event is the one that is meant for interaction and exchange. And for that, we will go into four breakout rooms, one per topic. We will discuss for 20 to 25 minutes in the breakout rooms. We will have a padlet to um, assist in this. And after the this exchange, we will reconvene and share, share the most important learnings from the discussion before the closing. Um, also remember to write your questions in the chat if um, something comes up and either we'll address this after the presentation or in the breakout rooms. And be, before we start with introducing you to, to the project, the overall aim of this event was to, to share with you what has um, some of the things that have things and, and activities that have happened in the ECS project so far in and share this with you in bite-sized pieces and in this input presentations before we we dip um yeah more in detail into this uh, in the breakout rooms and also um yeah offer offer the opportunity for exchange around these topics of interest so the ECS project the overall goal of the project is to widen and strengthen the European citizen science community. And we do that through capacity building and awareness raising activities. This um, can sound a bit abstract and a bit meta level, but the idea is that we strengthen um, European actors to carry out citizen science, and we also bring new actors on board. In EU project terminology, this is a coordination and support action. The project lasts for four years, and we are now just over a year and a half into the project. And you see the topic that um, this project responds to. It's called the capacity building and brokering network to make citizen science an integral part of the European research area. In the activities that you'll hear, we both, um, let's say, do citizen science, so it's a bit a bit hands-on, but it's um, very much um, on the meta level of building capacity and, and a project about citizen science. Yeah, important here, yeah, the duration of the project, four years, as I was mentioning, um, we have 12 partners and unaffiliated entities in the consortium representing 15 countries. And another network that um, supports the activities in the project is a network of 28 citizen science ambassadors from um, the 27 EU um, countries plus the UK. And you see here, I won't go into detail in all of this, but these are the main branches of the project. And today we are gonna focus on these four. So you see on the left and the, the blue dot, enhancing digital skills for fair um, and open science communities, fair standing for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable data. Then the top right in yellow, developing the ECS Academy with free training to increase the capacity to conduct citizen science. In red, advocating for citizen science and working on policy impact. And in green, investigating the impact of citizen science on research, society, and economy. And I'm aware this was a very short introduction to the project, um, but I would prefer to give space to our speakers today so that they can tell you a bit more about it. 
And we'll have first Amalia Cardenas from CSIC talking about data practices in citizen science. Then um, Teresa Schaefer from ZSI will talk about impact evaluation. After we'll have Moki Hackley from Université Paris Cité and Learning Planet Institute talking about the ACS Academy, capacity building and training. And last but not least, um, Marius Oesterheld from Museum, Museum für Network on the Berlin talking about the policy priorities in the project. So, um, Amalia, please, the floor is yours. Well, yeah. we'll jump the questions until Amalia mm -hmm. is done. Great, thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Amalia Cardenas. I will be presenting today for the CECIC team uh, that is leading work package three in this project. Ana Alvarez, Karen Soacha, and Jama Piera are also contributing, but they could not make it today. Uh, next slide. So for those of you not familiar with our work in this project, the CECIC team, along with several other partners, uh, we're working on enhancing digital skills for fair and open science communities. And we started to explore these ideas through the best practices report that was completed and published in July of 2023. If anyone wants to download it, it's now available on Zenodo. Um, and we're going to be continuing this work also on open and fair data with open and fair tools through a series of hackathons and datathons that we're organizing starting in April of this year and also uh, in, the, in 2025. In addition to this, in order to have greater impact with the datathons, we're also preparing a MOOC um, on data visualization and data analysis with a platform Orange. This will be training material that will be developed for the European Citizen Science Academy so anyone interested in, in data analysis and visualization, watch out and keep an eye out for that. Next slide. Great, I wanna start off with addressing why the best practices report was an important document to produce. So many of us working in the field know that citizen science projects and volunteers contributing to scientific research has sharply increased over the past decade. And public participation has emerged as one of the main and cost-effective sources for big data and knowledge production. As you can see here in this graph that I uh, added, over the past 20 years, you can see that there has been a sharp increase in the number of observations added to the JBEEF um, platform through participatory monitoring. And despite the great potential for citizen science and scientific contribution, at present, we are still facing some challenges that we need to consider as a community and as you know, people working in this field. And that was our first aim to address what some of these challenges are. So for example, um, one of the things that we need to grapple with is how do we ensure the viability of a citizen science project throughout the lifetime of a project? Or how can we ensure data quality what are some effective ways to engage and mobilize volunteers throughout time, right? Because if you don't have volunteers, you're not going to have any data. What happens to data after it's collected? Who owns it? How can we prevent misuse? How can we properly give credit to the thousands of individual contributors? These are just a few of the handfuls of questions that as a community, we need to think about and, and keep in mind as we're working uh, through this. Hello? Oh, I don't yes, see people. We, we are here. Okay. Yeah, we are focused. Okay. We are focused. All right. Okay. Uh, so for these reasons, our first goal with the best practices report was to map out experiences of collaborative development and see how other, other projects are addressing some of these questions. And also to look for ways to contribute to developing open and fair data with these open and fair tools. Our second aim was that we also wanted to offer a list of aspects to consider when planning the development of a technological service in citizen science. And indeed, the report can serve as a checklist of things to consider for an existing infrastructure or for projects that have already been implemented. Next one. 
Moving on to the details of the best practices report uh, to undertake the search and also the classification for practices that are quite diverse, we realized that we needed a conceptual framework for um, organizing all of these. And for this reason, we selected the science data lifecycle model, which provides a framework for understanding and managing data through an entire life cycle. And the elements in the data lifecycle model helped us map out proven practices into seven different sections. These include data infrastructure, data services, data collection, data standards, data quality assurance, data accessibility, data ownership, policy, and ethics. Using the data lifecycle model, it helped us ensure that we had a comprehensive coverage um, and effective management of data throughout its entire life cycle. Um, the next one. In addition to the conceptual framework, as we were digging through the literature, we realized that there's a lot of ethical aspects that we need to consider when managing data. And for this reason, in addition to the technical framework, um, we included an ethical framework, which primarily draws from the concepts of open science, open data, open infrastructures, fair data principles, and the X to 10 principles of citizen science. Next slide. Finally, co-design and co-development are central pillars in citizen science, and we expected to find more resources and documentation in this area, uh, but we didn't find a lot, of, a lot of information. And for this reason, we included um, a case study to the COS, COS for Cloud case study as a reference uh, for how to implement co-design and co-development of data services and data infrastructures. And we also included uh, resources on engagement and a communication strategy that can be used in a product, in a project. Uh, next slide. Finally, just for the sake of time, I'm not gonna go over every single key area, but I wanted to highlight some important things. Um, and again, we organized all of our, our findings in, in the categories of the data lifecycle model. But for example, in data infrastructures, um, we found that the complexity involved with managing and sustaining an infrastructure over time is something that the community is really grappling with, um, not only in the literature, but now as um, I'm talking to actual projects, we see that this is uh, a real pressing need. And in our review, we found that simplicity, flexibility, reuse of existing inf infrastructures or technologies instead of creating brand new ones could be a sustainable solution. Um, in terms of data services, the report offers suggestions for collaborative software development and knowledge exchange, for example, practices that make code maintainable and easy to use. We highlighted the need for documenting decisions, automating testing, implementing code reviews, and we pointed to strategies that uh, can be used for agile team collaboration. In terms of data collection and harmonizing data uh, coming from a variety of different sources, this is also something uh, that's quite challenging for many citizen science projects. And the report offers mechanisms, protocols, and tools that can help. And finally, in the category of data management, policy, and ethics, some important lessons that came up was the need for a clear data management policy um, on how data is handled among participants, the need for easy to understand terms of uh, data and privacy was also highlighted, and as well as the use for Creative Commons licenses. Uh, next slide. Some challenges that I wanted to highlight was that we found very limited resources and documentation regarding data security in the context of citizen science. We don't know why there's a, a lack of documentation or perhaps um, lack of experience in this field. It could be that there's a complexity of the legal requirements surrounding uh, data security, but this is definitely something that needs greater emphasis within the citizen science community. And again, we also found limited 
references to co-design and co-development. Um, and this could indicate a lack of people just are not document documenting their experiences or perhaps there's not an awareness for um, why it's very important to document and share these experiences. Um, I'm going to end it here, but uh, next slide, I just wanted to share some of the upcoming events. We're gonna be participating in the City Nature Challenge starting October 26th to the 29th. This is going to be part of our data acquisition uh, data funds that we will be implementing. If anyone is interested or has any questions, just let us know. And yeah, I'll end it here if anyone has questions. Thank you very much, Amalia, um, for sharing your inputs. Um, yeah, as the information that Amalia shared settles in uh, and questions might arise, uh, please feel free to put them in the chat and we'll uh, make sure to address them also in the in the breakout rooms in a second. And without further ado, um, Teresa, please go ahead. Thank you. Thanks for this nice presentation, Amalia. So um, I will introduce you to um, the work that we do on impact pathway assessment in a project. Um, well, this sounds a bit complicated, but that's that's um, what we actually actually look at is that we wanna um, find out what is the impact of the ECS project. Um, Claudia mentioned that we have quite some. Um, important objectives to reach, but we do not only want to look um, um, at the project's impact, but also beyond to the whole citizen science community in Europe. And, and you will see that we have started some activities to involve more projects in these discussions on impact. Um, how do we approach that? We have defined six impact areas. Um, there's the first impact area with, with regard, uh, where we look at the scientific and institutional impact of citizen science. Then we have the so social or societal and political impact and the economic and technological impact. And we want to investigate these impact areas and also find out if we need new impact metrics that we can use for uh, bringing evidence for the impact of citizen science. Next slide, please. Okay. Sorry, I clicked on the link. Um, that was yeah. the 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 logo of the MFN. One second. Okay. Yeah, because we do that not alone. We do that with uh, several partners, and that's why we. Uh, now on this um, uh, MFN website. Um, okay, now it would be great if you go to the next slide. Okay, um, while this is still loading, what you see here is these are these um, six impact areas. Um, and if you think about your own citizen science activities, maybe you you identify already first areas where you think that your activities might have an impact. So we have, for instance, the first area of the social impact, which is that we expect that citizen science has a positive influence on society yeah? by supporting uh, the community, empowerment, new knowledge and skills and all these aspects. Then we have the political impact, that is that we wanna support decision makers and policy makers with the citizen data from the citizen science projects for their policies, political decisions and activities. And we will hear about this uh, impact area later from Marius. We have the scientific impact where we expect that citizen science becomes really an integral part of, of creating high quality knowledge and um, that it helps to open up science and, and involve citizens in, in creating this high quality new knowledge um, to also meet societal needs with our research. We have the institutional impact where we want to look at uh, sustainable changes within um, organizations, like for instance, research performing organizations in how they promote citizen science within their organizations. We look at the technological impact. That means how does citizen science contribute to the technological advancement and uh, improving digital skills and literacy of participants, for instance. And finally, we have the economic impact, which is um, 
uh, how can citizen science contribute to economic growth and for instance job creation or environmental sustainability so these are the things that we look at this sounds like a really huge and very abstract concept um, and if we go to the next slide um, we uh, use uh, a very common model for evaluation, which is this mod logic model approach, um, where you try to break these huge impact areas down to something that is really traceable and where we can bring evidence for. Um, so for instance, uh, so when you look at this mo logic model, you start um, with concrete input and activities, uh, that are part of the planned work that you're doing, for instance, in a citizen science activity. And then you look at first at the outputs of these activities. So um, this is very often already described in our proposals or in the descriptions of work that we have uh, to provide for the funding agencies. So we describe what are we planning to do and what are the expected outputs in terms of workshops organized like this one here, participants reached, uh, documents created, technology developed, and so on. And all these outputs that we can describe then uh, create some outcomes that we, ex that these are the benefits that stakeholders have from using these outputs. So for instance, if I have an output of a training like the ECS Academy, an outcome would be an increased knowledge about citizen science, just to keep it very simple. And then, of course, these outcomes uh, can lead to bigger impacts. That means that um, this increased knowledge about citizen science might lead to the impact that citizen science is taken up more broadly by the scientific community and, and, and we then address societal needs better, just to, to keep that simple. So that's that's the logic model, how we, how we approach that. So that means that we bridge between the activities that we describe in the, in the work the plan and the KPIs and outputs that we are also described and uh, how they then contribute to these huge impact areas. And to the, at the next slide, you can see that these logic models look quite complicated and we have created some logic models for all of these six impact areas. Um, and if you go to the next slide, as this is really too much to present you in eight minutes, I just want to talk you through how, for instance, to through one example. So this is from the um, from the social impact area, just to take out one of these impact pathways. Um, so for instance, we have described in our activities that we have to do six pilots, including underrepresented groups in citizen science. That means that in citizen science, very often we see the same people joining our projects. And here we want to really address those groups that are normally not involved in our projects. And the output would be six implemented pilot activities, thousand participants um, participating. So this is the output that we also have described in our project description. The outcome from these activities would be that we have a bigger knowledge uh, on how to address these diverse user needs and what is the acceptance of users for our uh, different formats. Um, and the impact would then be if we really share this knowledge, so we have a new knowledge, we share it with other projects, uh, we talk about it, that we have an increased engagement of diverse societal actors in citizen science. And then as we have to look at the impact pathways, we also look at factors that might influence the success or failure of this pathway. Um, this might for be instance be that we have to really think about really, really engaging communication and dissemination um, when we set up our activities. And an external factor could be that these underrepresented groups, for instance, just don't have an interest to join. So we have to think about how to address these factors. So that's how we approach these, this in, in impact evaluation. But uh, if you go to the next slide. Ah, yeah, and this is this shows you also how we, next to the KPIs, how we have also defined some metrics that we want to look at um, uh, for the different areas like uh, mutual learning, new knowledge, growing citizens and science communities and all the things. So we have broken that down. Uh, and we have also defined some data collection methods uh, in qualitative and quantitative terms where we say, okay, how do we want to collect evidence for these things that we aim to reach for? 
And th that all of these things are defined in one of our reports that can also be found on Zenodo, where we set up the basis for this impact evaluation. And if you're interested in that and how we did that, you can also look into the report. And on the next slide, I want to say that it's very important for us to reach out also to the wider citizen science community to discuss impact it, 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 as it's very often a topic that is still perceived as a huge challenge and so we had for instance in 2023 20, one uh, meeting with other citizen science projects as part of the ECS collaboration group where we had a specific session on impact assessment and we discussed the specific challenges of impact assessment you see here one, one screenshot where we, for instance, discussed how to measure the positive influence on society, on social groups. And for instance, here we said, OK, how can we do that? Yeah, as a small project, how can we, we show this influence? And one of the suggestions was that we look not only at one project, but really at a whole group of projects and, and the whole landscape of citizen science projects and what kind of influence they have on, on society and social groups. Um, and this is why we have in next week uh, another um, meeting with the ESS collaboration group um, where we will work on creating citizen science impact landscape. That means we invite other citizen science projects to join the meeting next week on the, on the 5th of, of March and, and create with us a landscape of different impacts along the six impact areas that are let's say, uh, supported or influenced by the different projects. So this is an upcoming thing. If you are interested, please tell us. Um, and then there's one more thing. If you go to the next slide. Um, you know, there's the EXA conference in Vienna, or maybe you know that we have the, the EXA conference in Vienna in April. And there we have organized, we will organize a focus session, which is called Rethinking Impact Assessment of Citizen Science. And we will dedicate quite a lot of time in defining really what concretely is the challenge with this impact assessment. We have already frameworks for impact assessment. We have guidelines. We have even a platform to try to, to address impact assessment. Um, but why is it still a challenge? And what can we do? And what is it really concretely that is needed? And this focus session where you are all very uh, warmly invited if you are at the EXO conference, um, is also the kickoff for uh, the EXA working group on impact assessment that is currently in, in the creation where we want to create a, a group that discusses all these challenges and where we try to find bundle forces between the different researchers who work in, work in this area and support the citizen science community with some practical tools, discussions on impact assessment. Okay, so this, um, if you're interested to join the working group, please tell us as well. And if you're interested to join Reflections on Evaluation and Impact Assessment now, um, there is the breakout room where we will um, more broadly discuss on, and try to exchange your experiences on how do you approach evaluation and uh, impact assessment in your work? How do you break that down? What are your challenges that you would like to discuss that you think need to be addressed? And what is also good practice for others that you want to share? So if you're interested to join the discussion, um, please come to the breakout room later. And um, if you have questions now, this is the time. Thank you very much, Teresa, for sharing. There was a question from Maya that Moki just answered in the chat, mm -hmm. but um, maybe participants come with um, new, fresh questions uh, as they join the breakout room. Okay. Otherwise, as um, questions pop up, please, um, I'm repeating myself, but uh, put them in the chat. And with that, um, please, um, Moki, take it over for the ECS Academy. Thank you. Uh, and I'm going to cover in the next few minutes about the European Citizen Science Academy, which is the part of the project that is dedicated to training, education, and generally increasing the acceptance of citizen science within uh, scientific practices. Next. So the, the the project itself is running from the Learning Planet Institute, which is part of Université Paris-Cité. Um, and uh, the three people that are working on it are Zara Farouk, myself, and Clea Montanari. 
And what we are specifically aiming to achieve is getting more acceptance uh, in utilizing citizen science and research and innovation. So the kind of identifying the issue that it's not about the public joining in because we have evidence that there is more interest than uh, the amount of project that is offered by scientists. So we need to convince the scientists to use it more. and But we want it also to have it in a well-integrated way within the excellence research pillar. So that's within projects that are run by the ERC or by the Marie Curie uh, actions. Um, and to do that, we want to provide tailored training in different forms, and we want to especially accelerate activity by connecting citizen science educators and trainers across Europe and uh, further in the world, and also to provide training and activities. And we are especially linked to a collaboration with other work packages, like, for example, a focusing on public library is another place where we can increase and working as you heard with Amalia and the um, data team on the Citizen Science Data Academy. Next. So, but uh, what what we have done, we already got two networks that, that are starting to roll and develop. One of them is a network of uh, educators and trainers. So we define uh, trainers and educators as an individual that provide both formal or informal education to participants in the area of citizen science and community science and also to other researchers. Uh, we've got a blueprint to the European Citizen Science Academy, which I'll share soon uh, the link to, and also analyze the needs of citizen science educators. We also run a survey among early career researchers on what their need and we're analyzing the data there to uh, share it and also already developed a module on how to design a summer school in the area of citizen science. So what is it relevant for you? If you are either an educator or trainers, we are building up the network. If you are an early career researcher or you want to join in the network, we're aiming to provide mentorship and support for establishing citizen science. And if you also want to integrate citizen science in your institutions, such as university, uh, public library, and so on, we're there to help you too. Next. Thank you, Claudia, for the link. Um, the services that, that we're so currently capable of providing is module creation. So if you have in your project or thinking about developing a, a module that will be provided online, we both have the Moodle platform to provide the support for it, but also guidance and, tech, and a bit of technical support on how to implement it. And then you can share it in any European language. It doesn't need to be English uh, particularly, and we already have uh, different courses in different languages. We can offer co-design sessions to understand training needs and services, and kind of we are developing a list of different services. We can help you to organize training of interest via the academy, and we already teamed up with summer schools, with all kind of other things. And we, of course, happy to do the communication and outreach through the network that we created. Uh, we will create a mechanism also to pay for training and also to provide a certificate. So next. And some things that, that we have learned in the process. So we, we kind of, of course, learned that there are lots of organizations that already offer the training in public engagement and participatory science on its different forms. And we have the report on that and the detail for it. We, we have the network uh, of educator and trainers, and there is a, a network already in the US within the Association for the Advancement of Participatory Science. Uh, we, there is also such a network in the US, but we are starting to link researchers in both sides. Uh, trans citizen science in some places is, is kind of being used more as participatory science or research. So for example, in France, it's more common to call it participatory science. Uh, 
we see also mutualization of effort with many actors and that's really important so so we can already work together with different actors from different projects and that's an offering that that we believe very strongly in synergy with different actors so again the offer is is there for you to join in and I'll be happy to talk about it in the in the breakout room too next and the upcoming activities that we have. So very soon we'll finish the FAQ. So we hope to finish it next week. And then there will be a mailing list for the trainers and educators. We'll see how that runs. And then we'll open up a mailing list for researchers uh, with specific goal of, of doing that. We uh, starting with a series of training for early career researchers. Those are regular meeting organized with the Marie Curie Alumni Association. Um, we start with 1st of March with public engagement and, and each week there will be, uh, each sorry, each month we, we're having different activities and all these activities will also be collected and provided as a, a, on the Moodle platform. So if you are interested in that, you can reach out and we'll integrate you into that. You don't need to be a Marie Curie alumni to join it. Uh, we continue to develop the business plan of the uh, academy. On the 25th of March, we'll be having a co-design specifically on uh, how you integrate project-based learning into an introductory course on citizen science. So if you're interested in that, you're welcome to join. Uh, we also have a, a network of uh, trainers and, and meeting uh, discussing the gap in training analysis. Uh, next uh, next week, we will we'll also have a session within the Marie Curie Alumni Association Conference uh, in March. Uh, on 7 8th May in Paris, we have a training together with Liber on citizen science and research libraries. There is still a little bit of time to register. There are already uh, over 25 people that register, so you are welcome to find it out and register. I'll, I'll be happy to share with you the link and you can forward it to it. And in addition to working with Research Library, we'll also offer, together with SciStarter, training on citizen science in public libraries. So if you know about a public library in Europe that is doing citizen science, please get in touch about them. So that's next. And I think that's uh, asking, will you engage with us? How are you developing training? So thank you, and we would like to see you in the breakout room. And I'm open to question. I'll I'll put in the links to the library and to other things like that. Okay, Simona, thank you very much for doing that. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Moki, for sharing all of this. So you see um, that the capacity building aspect of the project is, uh, is strong and many things are coming up. Um, yeah, again, if you have any questions, drop them in, in the chat. Otherwise, we will continue with our last of our presenters today. They, that is uh, Marius Osterheld uh, for, on the policy impacts and recommendations in the project. Please, Marius. Thank you, Claudia. Um, as you just heard, I'm, I'm Marius from uh, the Museum for Natural History in Berlin. And together with my colleague Silke, who can't be here today, um, we are responsible for policy impacts and recommendations in this ECS project. I'll just quickly switch to my own uh, screen. Just a second. There we are. Um, I'm aware that this is lunchtime and you've already had a lot of input, so I'll keep this quite short. Um, our main goal uh, in terms of policy impact, um, policy, uh, policy engagement is to promote uh, citizen science as a powerful policy making tool and as a research approach uh, for scientific excellence and sus sustainable development in Europe. Um, as you're probably all aware, uh, the level of policy support, recognition, funding, et cetera, for citizen science uh, still varies considerably uh, across Europe. So um, there's quite some advocacy work um, that needs to be done. And at the same time, uh, there's a great untapped potential uh, when it comes to using citizen science generated results or data uh, in 
policy making and um, official statistics and data repositories. Um, what we do in more con concrete terms, um, or also maybe what, what we could offer to you as members of the citizen science community, um, uh, there's basically four, um, four pillars of our activities. One is that we organize events that bring together citizen, oh, sorry, Claudia, I forgot to say, next slide, please. Sorry for that. Um, so um, yeah, um, our services for the citizen science community, things that we could offer you potentially. Um, the first thing is that we organize events that bring together citizen science practitioners and policy makers. Uh, so we, we offer networking opportunities essentially. Uh, we also, uh, or offer opportunities for co-creation and for peer learning. Um, we co-create uh, recommend policy recommendations. We're, we are also very happy to co-design other types of materials that the community might be interested in. Um, thirdly, we uh, try to identify the windows of opportunity for policy engagement. So um, uh, hot topics are sort of being discussed uh, in the research community uh, where we can we can come in with our um, citizen science um, advocacy work um, and lastly we aim to develop resources for citizen science practitioners things like guidelines training materials to be shared with policymakers and that that sort of thing next slide please claudia um what we've been working on so far um, is we've examined the current, current state of, status of citizen science in uh, the countries represented by our ECS consortium members. Uh, we've collected lighthouse projects that have created policy impact. Uh, we've mapped decision makers um, from the local to the global level across various uh, sectors and fields. Um, and we've drafted a co-design strategy for policy engagement for our project um, that uh, was one of our project reports. It was submitted in July last year and can be found on Zenodo. Um, uh, and this strategy uh, defines five policy priorities based on which we have already begun uh, designing policy recommendations together with citizen science practitioners and other stakeholders. Um, next slide, please, Claudia. I'll just give you a brief overview of these policy priorities we have um, identified together as a consor consortium. Uh, the first is the use of, of uh, data and insights created by citizen science activities and projects uh, in the policy making process uh, or in official st statistics. The second is the integration of citizen science into elite or excellent research. Uh, thirdly, um, we want to lobby for the opening and adap adaptation of research funding programs to the specific requirements of citizen science. Um, we want to foster the integration of citizen science training into the curricula of uh, educational institutions. Um, and lastly, we uh, want to promote diversity and inclusion in citizen science. Next slide, please, Claudia. Thank you. Um, what we've learned so far, I've just put three things here that were fresh in my mind. Uh, one is that we found that there's a great demand in the community for more opportunities for peer learning, uh, specifically also for, for cross-border um, or international peer learning. Um, we've also heard from various stakeholders that um, several UN and EU institutions or agencies are very interested in integrating citizen science generated data into their statistics and monitoring programs, as well as in their policy cycles. Um, the uh, EU specifically will invest quite a bit of money in the future in, into creating uh, a science for policy ecosystem that also uh, integrates citizen science data. Um, 
And lastly, uh, redefining scientific excellence and reforming research assessment is currently high on the agenda for many citizen science stakeholders, uh, which provides us with a perfect window of opportunity for policy engagement. Um, next slide, please. And that was the segue to um, my slide on upcoming events. So um, the, the, the next event we will be organizing uh, will take place on 15th of March. Uh, it will be a, an online panel discussion on uh, redefining excellence, uh, the Koara the agreement as an opportunity uh, for the citizen science community. Um, and you're very welcome to join us. Um, I think Claudia will probably post the registration link. If not, I can do that in a minute. Um, secondly, uh, we, we are co-organizing a policy panel at the EXA conference, um, 3rd, 3rd of April, um, to talk about uh, the status of citizen science and uh, uh, where we are now, and where we are going in the next few years. Um, we're also uh, preparing a few workshops, uh, co-design peer learning opportunities. Um, two workshops will, will be held uh, in the context of the EXA conference. Um, here, the exact dates are still to be confirmed. And um, we're planning to organize a peer learning event on feeding CS generated data into the policy cycle that will prob probably be in May, 2024. If you're interested in, in joining or co-organizing events, um, please just write me a short email. Um, I'll put my email address in the chat. Uh, in a minute. Uh, next slide, please, Claudia. So if you'd like to rank and comment on our policy priorities or know more about Lighthouse projects or share your own experiences with policy engagement, um, please join our break breakout session. I'd be happy to see you there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Marius, for for sharing. Um, yeah. Again, are there any questions for our speakers? We before we move on to our next part. Okay, I don't see any movement yet. Uh, but if something comes up in the chat, uh, we will follow up on this. So, before we move on to the part in the breakout rooms, um, yeah, I will stop the recording. <laughs>